are alive with ground crews, pilots, judges. Talk is the talk of a close-knit group of experts, competitors from dozens of past air meets, and competitors today also, but at the same time old friends willing to help each other and watch out for each other. This is the one chance the pilots have to discuss the problems of today's program and the errors of yesterday. Uh, don't, don't change it too much. And I tell you who was crowding right uh, this way a bit too much, and that's Charlie. Yeah, Charlie's in close. He was uh, he Harold Pryor, right. the American Aerobat champion. Climbing all in. Taking it over from the up, upside down position and rolling it right back over to the upright wings level. Now, he's ready for it. Keep your eye on this airplane. Aerobats prefer the early morning, free of air turbulence. This is definitely not stunt flying, as aerobatic pilot Charlie Hillard is quick to point out. Uh, we were talking about the difference between stunt flying and precision aerobatic flying, and there is a big difference. Uh, I think to understand them, you have to know the definition of precision aerobatic flying. And my definition has always been precision aerobatic flying is uh, getting the ultimate of an airplane in ever known conceivable position and uh, getting the maximum performance out of the airplane at the same time. Now stunt flying, of course, is done with similar type airplanes, but the stunt flying is usually some something like flying through a house or crashing an airplane into a barn or uh, something of that nature, flying under bridges or that sort of thing. And we don't really want to connect the two together. This is actually precision aerobatic flying. Uh, it's a tremendous sport. It takes a lot of thought and study, and there's just a lot more involved than most people realize. This airplane I'm flying is called a Cryer craft. It uh, was built by Harold Cryer three years ago. It uh, weighs 900 pounds empty, and it's, I think, one of the finest aerobatic airplanes that's ever been built. Uh, it's powered by a 165 or 165 horsepower Warner engine. And of course, you can see it's a biplane. It has the double ailerons. Uh, when I say ailerons, this is what I'm talking about. Gives it much better control. I fly it with a sliding canopy on it. And you can actually fly it either way. I prefer the canopy, though, especially for long cross country flights. Uh, this is the instrument panel. This is my list of maneuvers. Uh, this is drawn out in a special code we use for aerobatics. Uh, it's called the Arresti Aero Cryptographic. And each one of these little diagrams actually means a maneuver. For instance, this first one here is a vertical slow roll. And you go into a half of a four point roll at a 45 going down and into a square outside loop. The little dashes mean inverted flight and the straight line means uh, level flight. Uh, the instruments, of course, are all grouped together. The two basic flight instruments that I use while I'm actually flying aerobatics are the airspeed and the altimeter. 
Uh, of course, I cross-check my in engine controls, but these two maneuvers here is what I rely on. Of course, you're always looking at the ground, too, to be sure that you don't get too close to it. In a few moments, these men will calmly step out of an airplane for the thrill of the crowd. You and Vern, we want to make our, regardless of which way the indicator goes, Bob, we'll make our approach this way toward the bleachers, exit prior to the grandstand or over the top, and you, one of you guys, track right and one track left. Yeah. Okay, you take the right, I'll take the right. I'd rather take the right. Uh, we're flying this way, I'll yeah. take the right. That's downwind. Okay. Okay. Right. You take the right, you take the left. Move out as far as you can and make it to at least 2,000 feet. Okay. Right. Yeah. And stay as close to, as close to the highway as you can. That way, when you pick up your gear and just walk to the highway, that's when they pick you up. Right. Okay. Okay? Okay, then that means I'll uh, be first out then. Yeah, I'll be second. Okay. And you guys gonna make another pass and then come down. Yeah, right. Well, you, guys, you guys are gonna make another pass. Right, we'll make a separate pass. You guys are going to run. Oh. Second pass, you want to burn up about 20 seconds of bomb before we leave, right? Yeah. Okay. So You're gonna be these doing five the men of the Sierra Para right. Center of Carson yeah, City are the veterans of some 2,000 free falls. Yeah, okay. Their skill and daring make them a top attraction at the air races. All right, you're number three, Danny, two, and I'm one. That's all right. In the hangar at the end of the field, Mechanics have been working against the clock to prepare Bill Stead's plane in time to enter the 190 midget race. Meanwhile, overhead, the sports biplanes are roaring to a finish at 150 miles per hour. Now, Bill Stead is anxiously awaiting the delivery of his midget 190. To this man's enthusiasm must be credited the revival of the national championship air races held here at Reno. At last, the plane arrives, but only just in time for registration. The 190 midgets, all home built, gross around 800 pounds and can reach speeds approaching 230 miles per hour. piloted by Bob Porter, wins the final. 
Now, take a nylon bag and some hot air, mix thoroughly, and you have a modern version of a device that was popular in the late 1700s. Then, take balloonist Jim Craig and his crew as they try to beat eight other contestants into the air for the Balloon Le Mans race. The pace in the air may be slow and graceful, but on the ground... The Le Mans race requires that the balloon be inflated, flown, landed, and deflated again one hour from the starting gun. The balloon farthest from the starting point is the winner. find out how Jim Craig does in the race later on. But first, let's take a look at one of the special events at the air races. In World War II, the Mustang made history. Today, under the skilled piloting of former test pilot Bob Hoover, the F-51 still provides a big thrill for the 8,000 people in the stands. It really does fly like a train. Can you imagine the design on the old Mustang? It's 23 years old. And still going, the airplane's still flying beautifully. And of course, this little beauty back in World War II wrote its own page in history. In fact, there was one fighter outfit that I recall which shot down 1,000 and four enemy aircraft during its tour of duty in the European theater in England. I suppose a Mustang was probably the first airplane capable of going all the way to Berlin as an escort fighter with the bombers. And it really did a job. 
In fact, it was even credited with shooting down some of the German jets toward the end of World War II. You know, it even wrote another page in history out in Korea. It was used for fighter bomber work there. North American built some 15,000 of the little birds. And it's surprising that an awful lot of them are still in flight today, being used as transportation for businessmen in the civil aviation area. I'm sure Bob Hoover is smoother in uncoordinated flight than most of us are in coordinated flight. There he is on the right wheel. As I've mentioned many times to people, both on the radio and in the stands, I think Bob's demonstration is so smooth that he sometimes loses the appreciation of the layman who doesn't fly, but he certainly has the awe and appreciation of all the pilots in the crowd, probably one of the most flawless precision demonstrations in the world today. The power and speed suggested by the Mustang and the Bearcat, even at rest, is the symbol of the air race itself. Now the highlight. The unlimited pylon is getting underway, and Mira Slovak, the 1964 winner, is warming up his Smirnoff Bearcat for this dramatic event. With speeds approaching 400 miles an hour, they're off. <laughs> an oil leak and has to come in. Precautions are automatically taken by the emergency crews just in case, but the disappointed pilot guides his craft to a safe landing. Racing the big ones isn't a hobby for the owners of small pocketbooks. Engine repairs can easily run from $1,000 to $10,000. Overhead, the last lap is in progress, with Darrell Greenemeyer of Van Nuys, California, firmly in the lead with an average of 375 miles per hour. Balloonists don't get lost, but they always have to be found. 5,000 feet up the side of a mountain, Jim Craig and his balloon have been found, in better shape than the exhausted crew members who traded truck for Jeep, then Jeep for horse, to reach this almost inaccessible spot. Jim didn't know it, but he'd won the race and the balloon event for the second year running and was again proclaimed U.S. champion of this rapidly growing and graceful sport. From hot air balloons to antique aircraft, here's a rare opportunity to see the wonderful machines that our forefathers flew when flight was experienced only by a daring few. To jets, the national air races provide a pageant of progress in the air Progress speeded in part by the skill and the enthusiasm 
of the men who engage in competitive flight.